Good morning, everyone. We are hosting a session on kidney research and clinical trials. We have talked about the need for more patients in clinical trials. Today, we have a panel of experts who will discuss different aspects of patients being involved in clinical trials. Our first presenter is Dr. Prabir Roy Chaudhary. He is a counselor for the American Society of Nephrology. He's a professor of medicine Division of Nephrology and Hypertension and co-director at the University of North Carolina Center. Doctor? Hello, my name is uh, Prabhi Roy Chaudhary and I'm truly delighted uh, to be here presenting before all of you. The topic of my presentation today is going to be clinical trials, opportunities for all. These are my disclosures, as you can see. So I'm gonna divide this presentation into three main parts. I'm initially going to talk to you about the huge need for patient-centered innovation in kidney diseases. I'm then going to switch track and tell you a little bit about inclusiveness in clinical trials. And then finally, I'm going to end with a message for the future. I want to start, however, with a very clear message for the present. And that is that we provide at the present time extremely poor value in end-stage kidney disease care. And I say that because we spend a huge amount of money, $34 billion per year on hemodialysis. And despite that, our outcomes for hemodialysis are 41% at five years, which is worse as compared to every sort of cancer other than perhaps pancreatic and brain cancer. And one of the reasons for this is that over the last 50 years, we have actually had very little change in dialysis technology. So if you compare the figure on the left to one on the right, I would argue with you that yes, there are some more bells and whistles, but the basic construct of hemodialysis has not changed over the last 50 years. Now I want you to contrast this picture with another technology rich area of life, which is computing. And I would argue very strongly that any of the little devices that all of you are holding in your hands and which you see on the right actually has more computing power than the IBM computer on the left. And so the challenge for us really is how do we break the cycle of a lack of innovation resulting in poor quality and outcomes and a high cost burden? And I'm going to argue that one of the ways that we can break the cycle is through patient-centered innovation. So what exactly is patient-centered innovation? Well, patient-centered innovation is innovation, and it could be discovery innovation or process of care innovation that targets the issues that are important to the patient, not necessarily the issues that are important to the physician, the payer, or to regulators, or to industry partners. And the reason that this is so important is that the issues that are important to patients are often very different from the issues that are important to healthcare professionals. And on this slide, you see an example from the hemodialysis world where both patients and their treating physicians were asked to rank the things that are important to them. And you can see that there is a very clear dichotomy. Patients rank things like the ability to travel, dialysis free time, and not feeling washed out at the end of dialysis as being important, but their physicians rank totally different things as being important. Physicians rank things like survival and hospitalization and drops in blood pressure as being important, while patients rank these far lower than things like ability to travel. So the big question then I think becomes for all of us as a community, how do we develop new therapies that address the issues that are important to patients? And the way to do that, of course, is to involve patients at every point in the drug development process, from initial ideation to patient-informed clinical trial design, to patient preferences, to risk-benefit outcomes, and most importantly, in the context of patient reported or patient centered outcomes. And I'm sure that you will be hearing about this uh, in other lectures during this session. Now, in my mind, at least, one of the most 
effective videos that I have ever seen about trying to get patients involved in the product development process was one that was made by Celeste Lee. And if we could go to that video. Hello, I'm Cece, a fellow kidney disease patient. For 33 years, I've done dialysis, both hemo and PD. I had a transplant for 10 years, and as you can imagine, too many pills, shots, and accesses to mention. As kidney patients, you and I both know that a few things in life are not optional. Strength, courage, persistence, and determination. No matter what life throws at us, we try to stay balanced, maintain our routine, and remain positive. But let's face it, we are often in a holding pattern. Kidney disease treatments have not changed much over the years. The options for patients like us have largely remained the same for many years. You want to help change that? We need you. Each day we're asked to share our lives with our treatment. But now, let's share our voice, ideas, opinions from patients like us. They matter. Key people are realizing our voices matter too. Here's what I found out. The Food and Drug Administration, often known as the FDA, is looking for patients living with kidney disease, like you and me, to provide input on how potential treatments of the future could look. Picture a big table. Around it are dialysis caregivers, researchers, doctors, nurses, and companies providing new products and treatments. They want us and our families to sit beside them and have a seat at this table. We'll work together to bring potential new treatment options, safe and effective ones, and ones that patients like you and me want and need. Imagine the future of your treatment. What does it look like? How does it improve your day-to-day -day life? This future doesn't have to remain just a dream. Join me and other patients to contribute our thoughts and make our ideas a possible reality. This is my invitation to you. Lend your voice and work with the people who can help make it happen with one shared goal, living better with kidney disease. To learn more about how to share your voice and work with people to help make it happen and sign up for a webinar, go to kidneyhealthinitiative.org. There you will find webinar dates and times and more information. So please join us. So that video was made by a dialysis patient called Celeste Lee. Now many of you may, know, may have known Celeste. Uh, she was the founding chair of the Patient and Family Partnership of the Kidney Health Initiative. Uh, she died about three years ago, and she died because she withdrew from dialysis because her bones were so brittle after 25 years of dialysis that her sternum was literally compressing down onto her heart. And I think her passing really should be a charge to all of us to try and develop therapies that target the issues that are important to patients. All right, so let's switch gears now and talk a little bit more about patient inclusiveness. And the reason we need to have patient inclusiveness in clinical trials is that ethnic and racial minorities have a very high incidence and prevalence rates of common diseases such as diabetes and of course, chronic kidney disease. At the same time, ethnic and racial minorities traditionally have had very low recruitment rates into clinical trials. And so if we excluded such groups from clinical trials, we really would disenfranchise a large proportion of patients who need therapies and access to safe and effective drugs, probably more in fact than the general population. And again, as all of you know, this is so important in the setting of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, where minorities constitute over 50% of the total kidney disease population as a result of the high incidence and prevalence rates of kidney disease in African Americans and in the Latinx population. So then the question comes, how are we doing in nephrology with regard to inclusiveness in clinical trials and recruiting patients into clinical trials? And the answer actually is not very good. The biggest problem that we have in kidney diseases is that particularly in the early stages of kidney disease, most patients don't even know that they have kidney disease, less than 10%. And so if you don't know that you have kidney disease, how do you motivate somebody to enroll into a trial to prevent kidney disease? 
But why is all of this important? Why is it so important, particularly at the present time, to have aggressive recruitment of patients like all of you into trials for kidney disease? And the reason it's important is that I think that we are right at the cusp of a new era for kidney disease therapy. So as many of you may have heard, there's a lot of excitement about new drugs, such as the SGLT2 inhibitors, which can actually for the first time prevent progression of kidney disease. And as a result, there are a lot of new trials that are coming down the pike. The problem of course is that if we as a community cannot enroll patients into these trials, these trials will fail and there will be a loss of enthusiasm for kidney disease innovation. And again, I just want to emphasize, for me as a nephrologist, this is the most exciting time in kidney diseases for the last 20 plus years. More importantly, I think that this is our moment. This is the moment for the kidney community and we absolutely need to seize the moment. The other example comes from COVID trials. We have to get people with kidney disease into COVID-19 vaccine and treatment studies. In particular, we have to get patients from the African-American and the Latinx communities with kidney disease into these trials. Otherwise, we're never going to know if these new vaccines and therapies for COVID actually work in the populations that are impacted the most by COVID-19. And I will point out to all of you, and I will say that Paul Conway and many others within AAKP have actually been champions for this, but I will point out that chronic kidney disease is not an exclusion for the Moderna vaccine study. So go to your physicians and try and get enrolled into the Moderna vaccine study, even if you have chronic kidney disease. So let's move on now to the barriers to inclusiveness in clinical trials. And as most things in life, communication and lack of trust, and this whole issue of cultural humility with regard to values and beliefs are obviously very, very important. But other issues are also important. Time commitments, awareness, the complexities of the research process, and then things like restrictive inclusion and exclusion criteria and complicated consent forms and of course insurance coverage. So what are the solutions? Well the solutions to a lack of inclusiveness in clinical trials in my mind at least come into three main buckets of strategies. Firstly strategies that address barriers to clinical trial awareness. Secondly strategies that focus on study design and implementation and this is both in the context of providers and research participants. And finally, strategies that address minority perceptions of the research process. Now, I want to build up a little bit more on that last point, because if we're going to be successful in getting patients into clinical trials, we have to focus, in my mind, on patient-driven solutions. And that's why organizations like Patients Like Me the Kidney Health Initiative Patient and Family Partnership Council and the Patient Leadership Council within the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative are so important. And the reason why this has to be patient driven in my mind, driven by all of you is that success in clinical trial enrollment and success in clinical trial inclusiveness is going to occur when patients, all of you, go to your physicians and demand participation in a clinical trial. That is the only way that we are going to be able to make kidney disease into an on-study specialty like oncology, where every clinic patient is offered participation in a clinical trial. So finally, the messages for the future. So my first message for the future is that we really, as a kidney community, have a unique opportunity to use the hemodialysis unit for a lot more than we actually do. So we have all of these patients, many of you, with a high comorbidity burden who go in three times a week into a high-tech medical environment. And all that we do in the dialysis unit is that we get our patients into the unit, we get them onto the machine 
We get them off the machine and we get them out of the unit. And of course, what we need to be doing is that we need to be looking after their hearts and their eyes and their skin and their vascular access and their legs and their psychosocial issues. But even more importantly, we need to be making our dialysis units into centers for clinical research and innovation. We need to develop a system whereby every patient in a dialysis unit needs to be enrolled in a process of care study with the dialysis center ideally as the unit of cluster randomization. We need to be moving towards a setting where we convert our dialysis units into hubs and factories of clinical research and innovation. And of course, we are very far from that at the present time. My second and last message really is about inequity in healthcare. So Martin Luther King said many years ago, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Now, clearly there are many issues that factor into inequity in healthcare. But when you think about clinical research and innovation, I do want to make the following points. So number one, all of us need to make an extra effort to make sure that minorities are included in clinical trials, or else we will have no real data about new drugs in the populations that are affected the most by kidney disease. The second point that I want to make is that when we get new drugs and devices, we have to ensure that these are available to everybody in our community. We have to make sure that the fruits of innovation in clinical research actually reduce rather than enhance disparities in kidney care. And the only way that we can ensure that this happens is if we do it together. Patients, all of you, health professionals, industry partners, federal agencies. And I think particularly at this point in our nation's history, that it is absolutely critical for all of us to do this. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation. Doctor, thank you for that insightful presentation. We have a question for you from one of our patients who is familiar with your work with AAKP. As a longtime ally of AAKP and staunch patient advocate, can you tell our audience what changes you have witnessed in respect to the value of patient preference and patient reported outcome data among leading researchers and companies? And do you expect that to continue? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a really important question, obviously. And I think the short answer is yes, and absolutely yes. So over the last, I would say eight years, I think there has been a huge change in the way that industry and federal agencies and health professions, professionals are actually looking at patient preference and patient reported outcomes. And I would say that a lot of the credit goes to the FDA, who has really been a champion for this, to the AAKP, Paul Conway, Richard Knight, many others who have been champions as well for this, and I would say to the Kidney Health Initiative, in a, particularly the Patient and Family Partnership Council of the Kidney Health Initiative. And again, there are many other organizations, but I think that what has happened now is that the community is realizing that it's absolutely no use to develop an innovation or a therapy that doesn't address the issues that are important to patients. And so to give you an example, a major initiative that I think some of you would be aware of is the Innovative Therapies in Renal Replacement Roadmap that has been brought out by the Kidney Health Initiative. And when we started this roadmap, we had absolutely no idea. We still have no idea what the future of renal replacement therapy is going to be like. Is it going to be a wearable kidney? Is it going to be an implantable kidney? Is it going to be a regenerated kidney? But regardless of what 
the final device or product was going to be like. One thing that we are very sure about and that we put right at the top of priorities when we started the roadmap is that it has to be something that makes a patient's life easier. That product, whatever it may be in the next three or five years, has to be something that allows patients to travel. It has to be something that reduces the number of medications and interventions and hospitalizations that a patient has to undergo. It has to be something that makes the patient feel better, something that doesn't make the patient feel washed out at the end of that treatment. And I think that's just an, one example, but throughout the spectrum of kidney disease, and I'm very proud of this, where all of us are talking about how do we develop therapies that address the issues that are important to patients? How do we bring patients into every step of the product development process? And again, I just have to recognize Celeste Lee, who you saw in that video, for just being such a huge champion of all of this. Our next presenter on this panel is Dr. Christo Teribuku. She is a counselor for the American Society of Nephrology, Section Chief Nephrology and Hypertension and Kidney Transplantation at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Doctor, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, AAKP, for inviting me to speak. It's great to be with you. Uh, I'm Crystal Gadabaku, and I'm Section Chief of Nephrology at Temple University School of Medicine. I'm here to talk to you about the Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network today. I wanna to give you a brief review of the study and tell you about some opportunities we have um, for you. I am a Neptune or Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network investigator. I'm also co-chair of recruitment and retention for this exciting study. So before we get to talk about the Neptune study, I just would like to talk about what nephrotic syndrome is. Um, some of you may have personal experience with this disease, but nephrotic syndrome is essentially a syndrome that is associated with heavy proteinuria or heavy protein in the urine that has devastating consequences. Although the individual diseases are considered rare diseases, collectively, they account for a large amount of end-stage renal disease in our country and are affected are, are affect, and affect individuals throughout the lifespan. Um, as it says there, up to 20% of children have end-stage renal disease from nephrotic syndrome, and it is the third most common cause of end-stage renal disease collectively in adults. As I said, it's a devastating illness with significant consequences. And unfortunately, the disease has traditionally been diagnosed by what is on what our pathologists read on the slide or kidney histology, and not really based on mechanisms. And that has been part of the problem. The treatments for these diseases are varied and, and many of them are toxic and the benefits are unpredictable. So nephrotic syndrome is associated with patient symptoms of swelling or edema, kidney failure, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a whole host of other symptoms that are annoying and sometimes disabling. In terms of the nephrotic syndrome as a whole, there are two types of nephrotic syndrome, what is called primary and secondary nephrotic syndrome. And actually the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome is diabetes, which is the most common cause of kidney failure. Um, and other illnesses like lupus and infections and cancer can also lead to nephrotic syndrome and they're called secondary um, causes or secondary nephrotic syndrome. These are generally treated by treating the underlying conditions. Um, the one that is most perplexing for us as doctors and harder to treat is primary um, nephrotic syndrome. And the diseases that are associated, that are considered primary nephrotic syndrome are listed there, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, that's quite a mouthful, so we usually say FSGS, minimal change disease and membranous nephropathy are the more common of the common, uh, more common primary causes. So the Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network, or Neptune, is a collaborative NIH-supported uh, investig investigational network 
that includes 27 sites in North America. We say North America because we have Toronto as a site. Um, so it's not only the US and we're conducting clinical and translational research on these very diseases that I mentioned, FSGS, minimal change in membranous nephropathy, as well as in pediatric patients who often don't get a biopsy in, um, for their nephrotic syndrome at all or later in, in later stages. And our overarching goal for this study is to really get to precision medicine for nephrotic syndrome to enact cures for this terrible disease. So what is the Neptune study all about? Well, we're really about finding the right trial for the right patient at the right time with nephrotic syndrome. The study has gone over three NIH funding cycles and has um, been involved with several phases. The first phase, and is, is actually an ongoing phase, is the observational study. And that is to uh, recruit and follow a number of patients with this disease. As I said, many of the entities are rare diseases. So it has been hard in the past to actually have enough patients to follow them and really understand the course of disease. This study has done so for the first time. And we do this as early as possible in adults at the time that they are actually diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome and go for a kidney biopsy, where we collect blood and urine samples and collect m multiple um, points of data to understand the disease. The next um, step or phases we do is to do classification of these diseases using sophisticated molecular techniques. And then what we're trying to do in this study is reinvent the way we actually diagnose this disease to get to more um, effective treatments. Um, so do away with the, just the pathology view of a on a slide as a way of knowing what is actually happening in patients. And now we're entering a new phase, the Molecular Nephrology Board towards tar targeted treatments. And that is being able to put all the pieces of molecular data and information together to understand mechanisms of disease that can be used to find targeted specific treatments to fix those mechanisms and actually aim towards cures. In this study, we have several goals. Our first goal was to recruit a population of, of patients that we could follow and um, uh, watch along a time period to understand nephrotic syndrome much more fully and in greater detail. And as I said before, to identify molecular pathways that are responsible for this disease so that we can come up with treatments. As a lot of effort has been put into um, having this, these patient cohorts and amassing this uh, huge amount of data, we have uh, created ancillary study programs that again, allow us to take the information we know and even understand various other aspects of the disease that have never been studied before. And then lastly, having this uh, group of uh, experts in, in the field, and the patient population, marrying that together within this infrastructure, this has become a wonderful um, platform for training the investigators for these types of diseases that will actually, we will hand the baton to, to continue to find better ways of treatment, treat, treating patients. So what do we do in the Neptune study? Well, as I said, we have these two clinical cohorts, adults and children with these diseases that we determine at the time of uh, the kidney biopsy. Now, the kidney biopsy is being done for clinical use um, to be able to diagnose and treat patients. We then take pieces of the tissue and store it for further analysis and for research. So there's a biopsy cohort that is, uh, that is uh, part of the study. And as well, there's a non-biopsy cohort that is made up of children. As I said before, in nephrotic syndrome, many children aren't biopsied at the first time they present with their disease because there are diseases that are more common and that the idea of a biopsy may be a lot for a child to handle. And But we wanted to capture these patients, these children, at very early stages so that we too would find out as much information as we do in the adults. And so children with nephrotic syndrome without biopsy make up the non-biopsy cohort. As you can see in the lower end of the slide, we have, ha we have amassed a number of patients 
with this with these diseases, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, minimal change membranous, and the nephrotic syndrome in the ch in children. And this has taken much work, and it's been almost a decade of recruitment and uh, organization within Neptune. And what we do is gather all of this information. We have demographic information, age, um, race, uh, information about family history, et cetera. Much of the clinical information that is obtained when they're seeing their doctors uh, as well. I am very happy to report that we have obtained patient reported outcomes, information specifically of what patients are feeling when they have this disease and how important that may play into the role of treatment, therapy, and management. We are also gathering information about the neighborhoods because we know that environment may be very important in the way these diseases end up um, in patients. And then we have a whole slew of information that we collect about the patients on the scientific basis, the genes, we look at scarring, we look at the kidney and the kidney, um, how it looks and multiple descriptors under the microscope. And we look at various machinery that uh, allows the body to function, as well as our goal is to obtain mar markers that would help us uh, and probably, hopefully in the future, eliminate our ability to have to do invasive procedures like biopsies. We store these in, in a biorepository and we also have really nice state-of-the-art expertise in digital pathology, which helps us to um, get a much better view of, of the kidney tissue than we've ever had in the past um, and, and being viewed by a number of experts in the field simultaneously. So what's new in Neptune, our third cycle of Neptune is Neptune Match. And this is where it's getting really, really exciting because the goal now is to do what we've always wanted to do, aim towards better treatments. So in this part of the study, we continue to recruit, recruit patients for Neptune for the observational cohort as shown here. But what we will do now is we will um, amass all our knowledge to understand molecular mechanisms that are, are characteristic of each person's uh, disease. And we're working on communicating what those particular um, factors or characteristics are that may um, be better for one or another particular trial. And as I said, we don't know that yet, but the idea is that if we target more towards the mechanisms of the disease or match the disease with the treatment, we may have better success. And then in the end, we plan on comparing patients who've been in, involved in this match process with patients that have been just traditionally recruited for studies based on uh, traditional markers. We have a match report, which is similar to what you saw on the last page, which uh, basically shows the um, where a number of trials and your molecular profile and says whether you may be more likely to match with this type of trial or another based on the treatments and what the treatment is targeted towards. Now, these are only a few trials we have that are linked to Neptune. It doesn't mean that you can't participate in any trial that's out there. The patients can, and we're not even sure of the response. That's what makes it research. But the idea is that we get closer to a more personalized approach to treatment. So that really is a great segue into precision kidney medicine, which is really our aim or personalized kidney medicine. And what that means is basically giving the exact right medicine for a cure um, for each patient. And that even though nephrotic syndrome is made up of all of these diseases, and even FSGS may be uh, a number of diseases that we can really target the right drug at the right time for the right person. And we think this is really important in kidney disease because we think this can serve as a model for treatment of not only nephrotic syndrome, but multiple other diseases. And then if we incorporate patient reported outcomes and how people feel on their treatments, we could do an even better job of finding the best way to manage patients. Where do you potentially come in? Well, we actually need your help. We have formed, I'm very happy to say that in this um, cycle of funding, we've formed the Neptune Patient Advisory Council for Therapies, or NPACT. And the purpose of this group is to have 
patients involved in the research as we move along and to help us better do the studies and better find better um, equipped to find treatments and just to be more effective at what we're doing and our goals. So the goal of this patient advisory council is to provide fee feedback on research studies, to provide feedback on patient facing study material, particularly as we're at this critical time of really getting to the treatments and facilitate development of study specific patient reports. I serve as a co-lead of this uh, council along with a patient and it's been a wonderful um, addition to the Neptune study thus far. So what are we looking for? We're looking for members to join our impact group. Right now it's a small group of a handful of people and they've been incredibly helpful in, uh, in, in uh, obtaining the information and feedback, giving the patient voice to the uh, things that have come up so far in the study, but we need more. We need approximately 30 to 40 people to participate. We're looking for all ages because this disease is, affects all ages. So we're looking for teens, adolescents, parents of children and adults who have the, who have the personal experience of these diseases, who could speak to these diseases much more than I, I can in, and to help us in moving this study forward. And there is some contact information about that. So what are you gonna be doing? Well, what we're really asking is to have a patient advisory board to help us with this study, with the design, the materials and approaches to patients. For instance, what we've done already with our participant advisory group is they've helped us um, formulate the match protocol and how we communicate on a video the match results to the patients that would make most sense to people and how we do it in a more most comfortable, comfortable manner. Also, they've helped us um, formulate how we're going to convey genetic information, which can be very complicated and very hard to understand. How we can best um, tell people about the genetic information and what, what should we actually be telling? What, what do patients want to know about genetics? So what it'll involve is actually a, a conference calls of, of one hour to 90 minutes, two to three times a year, which isn't um, really that much compared to the benefits that you have on our on our study. And this would be also, and also maybe occasionally provide other information that may be more timely. So we're asking for people who've had the experience of nephrotic syndrome and have had these diseases or have been um, closely affiliated as a parent with a child who's had this disease to help us in, in creating a better study that actually reaches the goal of, of a cure. The information below, you can either email neptunepab at umich.edu or call that number 734-615-5017 and speak to Amanda Williams who can tell you a lot more about eligibility for this. So I have to acknowledge that the Neptune Network, it's a huge group of wonderful people that I collaborate with. It really takes a village, um, the staff, the study coordinators, and of course the patients. It's been a, a joy to participate in this study and see us move along. And I think there's so much more exciting things that can happen. We are federally funded and also funded by NEFCURE. We are happy um, to have this funding to continue to work along. And I'm happy to have been able to have the opportunity to tell you about nephrotic syndrome and what we're doing in Neptune study. I thank um, the organizers, AAKP, for having me. Thank you for your presentation. And now we do have a question for you. I think that would be very helpful to some of our listeners. AAKP has been involved in making certain kidney patients are actively encouraged to participate in clinical trials. For the companies who are listening in on this presentation today, what advice would you give those seeking to involve more minority patients in clinical trials? Thank you. That's an excellent question. I've actually done some research in this area with regard to kidney disease. And it turns out that people may be somewhat reluctant at the idea of research, but in general, minority patients, just as all other people 
are interested in making a difference and they're interested in improving their health. And so much of this depends on how the information is conveyed. And first and foremost, if you're at the, play, at the right place at the right time where you can interact with people. Another thing that I found that was very important is many of these patients um, have established a relationship with their physicians and working with their physicians, making sure their physicians understand what the study is about and can work with the patients to talk to them about the study engenders um, more trust and understanding about what is being done. Also, I think it is extremely important to convey to patients that there is a health disparities with kidney disease. And people like African-Americans and Hispanics have greater kidney disease than other populations. And so their contribution may be very important, not only to their health, but the health of their families, future generations. So I think those are important things that need to be discussed in a, um, in a non-confrontational way with the opportunity for people to ask questions and to enter into a discussion about, uh, about the studies and what the overall goals are. Thank you. Again, Doc, thank you for that informative response to that question that is being asked quite often these days. So we appreciate you responding and assisting other companies. Our next panelist is Dr. Sager Nwikar. He is co-director of Kidney Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's medical director of FKC Chelsea, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I turn it over to you, doctor. I'm Dr. Sagar Nigwekar. I'm a nephrologist and a clinical researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm truly honored and humbled to receive this invitation from the AAKP leadership to present my thoughts as they relate to patient participation in research and also clinical care, and to share these thoughts at this platform of the 45th annual national meeting. I would like to congratulate the AAKP leadership and all its members for an extraordinary run on advocacy, education, research that the organization has played as well as excitement that folks like me have around AAKP as we look into the future for patients who have problems with their kidneys. What I thought I will do in the next few minutes is to share with you some perspectives that we have learned over the years in my role as the co-director of the Kidney Research Center at the Massachusetts General hospital. At present, I am an assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School, and I also serve as an associate physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. My primary research interest, as well as a clinical interest, is focused on a rare but devastating disorder known as calciphylaxis. And I will share some thoughts as they relate to that disease in this presentation. I will also share some exciting new applications that we are pursuing where we really feel that the patient engagement, the patient choice, the patient voice are going to be critically important. So I look forward to your thoughts as I go through this presentation and my contact information is on this slide and I welcome your comments as well as opinions on this presentation and also thoughts as we build our program for the future. Kidney Research Center at the Massachusetts General Hospital is a multidisciplinary group of individuals coming from a variety of diverse backgrounds. We have physicians, we have nurses, we have research coordinators, we have a statistician, pharmacist. This center 
was originally the brainchild of Dr. Ravi Thadani, who happens to be my mentor for many, many, many decades. At present, the center is co-led by me and one of my close colleagues, Dr. Sahir Kalim. What truly distinguishes, we feel, our center from many other research avenues is we have a dedicated patient and family advisory council. This council has been extraordinarily important in terms of giving feedback on our selection of studies for research, as well as designing those studies, selecting specific endpoints for our trials, assessing which outcomes are the most important for the patients, assessing feasibility of our prospective studies, so on and so forth. And it's been extraordinary experience for us to learn the perspectives from both patients as well as their informal caregivers to shape up our research agenda. And obviously, as you can imagine, research is one of the engines that subsequently fuels the clinical paradigms and clinical protocols that get implemented across the clinical centers. This is a picture, of course, taken uh, before uh, the COVID pandemic, where we got together for our annual uh, picture in the Ether Dome, which is happen, which happens to be the first, uh, which happens to be the first location where anesthesia was used in the world, and this, of course, is um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital here in Boston, Massachusetts. So let me give you a little bit of a background about the rare disease that I was describing before and then also share some perspectives in terms of how the patient engagement has really guided our both clinical and research agendas. I would like to apologize to some of you uh, who see these pictures on the screen and find them quite uh, uh, gross in many ways. However, unfortunately, this happens to be the reality for individuals who are suffering from this rare disorder known as calciphylaxis. I hope you can see the panels A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, which demonstrate skin lesions that individuals with calciphylaxis develop. This disorder, for reasons that are not entirely clear, predominantly affects individuals who have advanced kidney disease. Majority of these patients happen to be on dialysis. The condition presents with painful skin lesions shown in these images, which have tendency to quickly progress from an initial swelling or just redness all the way to severe ulcers as shown in images from F to H. The lesions are frequently covered with black covering known as escar. And these lesions develop because the blood flow to the skin in these individuals has been compromised. If you are able to notice the panels K and L, which demonstrate some sections that we have taken from the skin tissues of patients who had developed calciphylaxis and have noted the blood vessels as shown with those circular or oval uh, 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 structures, uh, those are occluded, meaning those are blocked. And as a result, the blood flow to the skin is getting cut off and the skin is craving for blood and oxygen. And as a result, develops pain, swellings, redness, and in the end, ulcers. These lesions happen to be a great spot for bacteria to set their shop. And unfortunately, infection of these skin lesions leading to severe complications such as sepsis, meaning the blood involvement from the infection happens to be the most common cause of death in many of these patients. This is a rare disorder, which is of course a great news. If we see um, uh, approximately 1000 dialysis patients for one year, maybe two or three of these patients will develop calciphylaxis. But unfortunately for those who develop this complication, the death rate approaches almost 50% at one year. And as you can imagine, as a result of the pain, the risk of infection, 
the rates of hospitalization are quite high in this population. At present, there is no approved therapy for calciphylaxis. And research groups such as ours and other, group, other groups across the world have been working to develop new therapies for this rare but devastating disorder. So let me outline some experiences over the last few years where we have truly benefited from patient engagement and patient preferred outcomes for the studies related to calciphylaxis. Our patient and family advisory council has, in, has been involved right from the planning of the study. In fact, we I remember presenting proposals where we had choices to make in terms of should we design a prospective study, meaning where investigators will follow patients um, in a serial fashion over a long period of time? Or should we do a more like a cross-sectional study where the investigators just take a snapshot of the population to understand what is going on in terms of the disease epidemiology? And those discussions with the patient and the family advisory council were key to building up our registry of calciphylaxis patients, which is known as Partners Calciphylaxis Biorepository and Patient Registry. This registry is available for further information on the clinicaltrials.gov website. I uh, welcome you to visit that website and again, share your thoughts on our study. Through this study, what we are doing is we are collecting clinical data as well as blood samples, and in some cases, skin tissue samples from patients who have developed calciphylaxis. The patient's inputs and the caregiver inputs were important to assess some of the benefits and the risks of such a study. We also discussed what will be a meaningful improvement or meaningful change in an outcome that the patient will appreciate. Because many a times we have found that there is a complete discrepancy between what a clinician thinks as the uh, favorable outcome as opposed to what a patient thinks as a favorable outcome. Similarly, we have noticed that there are differences in terms of what a clinician will appreciate as a potential risk as opposed to the patient's appreciation for a potential risk. It's been fascinating to learn how these preferences and acceptances vary across the patient subgroups, maybe based on the race, based on the ethnicity, based on the socioeconomic status, based on the patient's health literacy, so on and so forth. So the field is very nuanced and it's highly important for researchers like us to get inputs from as many patients and their caregivers as we can. And in that regard, we really find the new, uh, the new collaboration with the AAKP that I will describe in the next few slides, highly, highly motivating. We have also taken patient insights to define the clinical endpoints for our clinical trials. For example, calciphylaxis is a painful condition. So in fact, we are now running clinical trials where we are using pain intensity, pain severity as one of the primary endpoints in those clinical trials. Frequently, we have used the patient's guidance to decide the question of feasibility. It may initially appear to our research staff and uh, research coordinators that, oh, this is relatively feasible. I can um, uh, uh, ask the patient to come to the research center uh, for a research visit every week. But when we listen to the patients and the burdens that they have, particularly those who are getting in-center hemodialysis three times a week, it is quite difficult for them to come to our research center for an additional visit. In those instances, it has been very helpful for us to actually go to their dialysis facilities and gather the requested information. And those kind of inputs have obviously come from the patients and in sometimes from their informal caregivers. And those inputs have really improved the efficiency of our studies, both in terms of design, in terms of outcomes, and also in terms of getting the question of feasibility right. 
The new uh, collaboration that I was mentioning in my previous discussion with the AAKP is about this project where our research team in collaboration with many other academic centers across the United States is championing the association and the appreciation of COVID-19 testing, contact tracing, and vaccination among in-center dialysis patients. As all of you know, uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic. These are very, very difficult and troubled times. Unfortunately, our patients who have end-stage kidney disease and those who receive in-center hemodialysis have higher exposure probability to the virus that causes COVID-19. This heightened exposure comes partly because our patients have to travel to a dialysis facility on average three times a week. In addition, they are spending three to four hours for every session of dialysis in a dialysis facility. So the risk of exposure in those uh, instances obviously goes up. In addition, our dialysis patients, because of their demographic uh, descriptions, such as high proportion of patients from minority communities, high proportion of patients with Hispanic ethnicity, as well as in many individuals, increased uh, prevalence of poverty, as well as low health literacy, advanced age, and comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, high uh, incidence of heart problems, all these conditions together really increase the probability that not only our patients will have increased exposure, but also more severe COVID-19 disease once they are exposed to this virus. We know that the best methods to mitigate this risk are going to be around testing, contact tracing, and once the vaccination becomes available to wide, widely use that vaccine, which hopefully will be of course effective and safe uh, to really mitigate the risk of COVID-19 transmission. But at present, we are not confident in terms of what the patient preferences will be with regards to the acceptance and uptake for COVID-19 testing, contact tracing, as well as future vaccination. So we are in the process of submitting a research study grant to the NIH. This proposal is being prepared at present and will be submitted to the NIH in the next week or so. I'm very, very honored to announce that the AAKP leadership and the membership will be a key collaborator on this proposal. Through this proposal, we plan to enroll many hundreds of patients across the country who have end-stage kidney disease and are treated with in-center hemodialysis. These patients will be given an opportunity to participate in a study that will comprise of filling out some survey forms, as well as participating in interviews, which will be conducted via either a video platform or a telephone platform to assess the individual factors, such as patients' social, economic backgrounds, interpersonal factors, specifically examples include stigma, mistrust, or perceived discrimination, and also community level factors, such as geography, public transportation, community resource availability. Understanding these factors, we believe, will help us design future trials that then can address these factors to really enhance the acceptability as well as the uptake of contact tracing, testing, and vaccination for COVID-19. I would like to thank you for your attention. I would also like to thank the AAKP leadership for this invitation. 
and would like to congratulate the organization for the phenomenal success and the 45th annual meeting. I would like to leave you with this quote by Nelson Mandela, which really makes the point that until we try, we are not going to see the results. And in that sense, I'm really looking forward to working with the patient members of the AAKP for our future studies. My contact information was on the previous slide, and I welcome thoughts and suggestions from all of you currently and also in future. Thank you. Doc, thank you for your presentation. And if you don't mind, I have the following question for you. Can you tell us based on your work at Mass General and Harvard, the value of patient engagement and patient preference information and how you practically apply that to your work? Thank you for that question. Our group and leadership really believes that for clinical research, patient participation and understanding patient preferences and focusing on patient reported outcomes is critically important. A few examples of how we have incorporated patient preferences and patient reported outcomes in our research areas will be outlined in the next few minutes. So my primary interest is in a rare disease known as calciphylaxis, which presents with painful skin lesions. When we were starting some of the earliest clinical trials for calciphylaxis, it became quite clear that if we plan those studies with the endpoint such as hospitalization or death, we may not have sufficient power to really get to that endpoint. More importantly, when we discussed with our patient and family advisory council, what are the endpoints that are truly meaningful to them? And what are the meaningful changes in those outcomes? The answers we got were quite different than what we were originally thinking. Patients really cared about the pain intensity. They really cared about the quality of life. They really cared about how frequently the dressings have to be changed. All those inputs were taken into account to assess risk and the benefit as it relates to an individual patient in the design of our clinical trial. We are also embarking on another trial where we are trying to address chronic pain and opioid use among dialysis patients. This trial is currently in planning and we are hoping that again with the inputs from the patients and their family members, we will be able to design a study that truly answers questions that are in line with the patient preferences. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your response to that question. Our final presenter for this session is Dr. Elisa Gordon. She is professor of surgery, organ transplantation at Northwest University. Take it away, doctor. I would like to thank Mr. Richard Knight, Mr. Paul Conway, and the AAKP for this wonderful opportunity to present. My name is Elisa Gordon, and I'm a professor at Northwestern University. I've had the pleasure to work with Mr. Knight and Mr. Conway on the study that I'll be talking about, and I wanted to acknowledge that it was supported by the Greenwell Foundation. The Institute of Medicine in 2001 talked about the six principles of quality healthcare, that it's safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and effective. And what I'd like to discuss today is one of those principles, patient-centered care. The Institute of Medicine defines patient-centered care as, quote, providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. Ultimately, the main goal of patient-centered care is to improve individual health outcomes. Um, there are many other benefits too, like improved patient satisfaction, provider productivity, and reduced healthcare costs. 
Many people have discussed how to achieve patient-centered care and routine clinical care, such as by patient provider open communication with eye contact um, and patients being engaged as active participants in their healthcare. Um, there are other ways to achieve patient-centered care, such as by participating in clinical trials in order to make future care patient-centered, and by participating in social science research that identifies patients' healthcare needs. So specifically, uh, patients can provide insights into the best way that research studies could obtain informed consent. And I'm going to focus on this very last point in the rest of my talk. There are many types of research studies which are designed to advance generalizable knowledge, and clinical trials can be defined as a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions, which may include a placebo or other control, to evaluate the effects of those interventions on health-related biomedical or biobehavioral outcomes. Patient participation in transplant clinical trials and social science research is extremely valuable because it can potentially benefit patients themselves, future patients, and the field of organ transplantation. And now I'd like to discuss my social science research study about an experimental treatment option to reduce the organ shortage. Deceased donor organ intervention research, which we can refer to here as intervention research, aims to increase the quantity and quality of deceased donor organs used for transplantation in two ways, by alleviating organ injury, as well as enhancing organ functionality. And this intervention research is really necessary because organ quality declines upon its, the organ's removal from a deceased donor, and that then leads to decreased organ function and survival in recipients. There are different types of intervention research. Here are a couple examples. You might cool down the donor's body to better preserve the organs before organ retrieval, or you might give a blood pressure lowering drug to the deceased donor before the organ retrieval. Um, and data collection can occur in the donor or on the organ outside of the donor's body or on the recipient's outcome. So, Intervention research can occur either like in the donor and the organ or in both the donor organ and the recipient. To evaluate intervention research outcomes, recipients participation can be non-invasive, such as through participating in, in surveys or medical chart review, or it could be invasive in nature, like through blood tests or biopsies. In the case of intervention research that involves the recipient, the ethical and regulatory issues become pretty muddied. Um, recipients accepting an intervention organ would ordinarily be considered by federal regulations as human subjects if data are collected on them post-transplant. In order to be considered a human subject, research investigators must obtain either identifiable private information or data through an interaction with the participant. And so pay attention to this word interaction because it's, it's like uh, the same thing as an intervention. The problem is, is that the regulations are not clear about whether transplant recipients are considered as human subjects if no data are collected on them after accepting an intervention organ. So a big question has come up. Does accepting an intervention organ make recipients into a human subject? Some may argue no, because the intervention only occurred in the donor or the organ before it was implanted into the recipient. But others may argue yes, because the intervention organ has been manipulated through the intervention research and the intervention organ does not comprise the standard of care. Another big question is, even if the recipients are considered human subjects, is informed consent necessary? The federal regulations state that informed consent can be waived when the risks are considered minimal. And that means that the probability and the magnitude of those risks, um, whether of the psychological or physical harms from participating in the research, are no greater than those kinds of harms that you ordinarily encounter in daily life, such as by going to your medical or dental or psychological examinations. The designation of human subject is very important because there are institutional mechanisms in place 
uh, designed to protect human subjects' rights, such as making sure that human subjects are able to give informed consent. The problem is, is that these issues came under the spotlight when the consumer rights advocacy group called Public Citizen sent a letter to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Human Research Protections. And that happened in 2016. The letter stated that an intervention research study that was led by Dr. Klaus Niemann violated human subjects protections because kidney recipients were not being informed of the intervention research organs before their transplant. And the Institutional Review Board overseeing the study had considered the risks to be minimal. Thereafter, the National Academies of Science convened in 2016 and 17 to try to address these ethical issues, including how do, what's the best way to carry out informed consent for recipients. Uh, given that there are these time constraints at the time of the organ offer to communicate all about these organs. And they suggested that candidates be informed about the idea of intervention research at the time of waitlisting, and then again about the specifics of the organ and the study at the time of the organ offer. The key concern is that giving both clinical informed consent for standard care and research informed consent for participating in the research could cause delay in organ placement, reduce organ quality, or even lead to organ discard. So just to clarify here, research informed consent differs from clinical consent by discussing, in, in research consent, it, it also entails discussing the study, voluntariness to participate in the study, and the risks to participants from study participation. Intervention research maintains some, it is, has become somewhat stifled at this point, and we need to get these ethical and regulatory and legal issues resolved before it can really move forward in full force. But little is known about patients' perceptions on these issues. And patients' perceptions are really important because they can help to resolve these ethical and regulatory issues. So now what I'd like to share is what we found in our research about patients' perceptions of intervention research. So our study aimed to assess organ transplant candidates' preferences for giving informed consent for and accepting intervention organs. We conducted the study across multiple institutions, including Northwestern University, University of Pennsylvania, the American Association of Kidney Patients, the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and the Lung Transplant Foundation. And we included in our sample adult kidney, liver, heart, and lung transplant candidates. And we conducted in-depth interviews and a survey. In the interview, we interviewed 61 transplant candidates, and for the survey, there were a total of 425 candidates, of whom 249 were kidney candidates. So going back to the first one of those ethical questions, are intervention organ transplant recipients human subjects? We asked on our survey, uh, the question was, how much do you agree with the following? The act of accepting an organ that had been in intervention research makes the recipient a participant in intervention research. And we found that most patients said, yes, merely accepting an intervention organ makes one a human subject. That's really informative. Then moving on to that second of ethical questions, should informed consent be required for intervention organ recipients? In our interview, we asked the following question. How much do you need or want to be informed and asked to consent before accepting a research organ without any further involvement in the research study? 82% needed or wanted to give informed consent. So even though no data would be collected post-transplant, candidates would still feel like informed consent is required. And here's a little bit more nuance to that same question of should informed consent be required for intervention organ re recipients? Um, in the interview, we also asked, do you agree with the following? Waitlisted patients should give in research-informed consent in addition to giving clinical-informed consent to accept intervention organs with minimal risk from research participation. And we found that 66% agreed. So even though the intervention research posed minimal risk, most candidates still wanted to give research and clinical-informed consent. 
And in our interviews, participants relayed that they wanted to know what was going on in their body in order to be prepared. Hearing what our study participants wanted to know about intervention research may help other candidates become prepared to ask their doctor, should intervention research become an opportunity for them? And so based on our interviews, candidates reported several things that they wanted to know. They wanted to know about the donor. For example, they wanted to know about the donor's lifestyle, their age, their diseases, their cause of death. They wanted to know about the organ, um, its health, its function, the amount of time it was outside of the, or the donor's body, um, the extent to which there was a match between the donor organ and the recipient. They wanted to know about the intervention. What was done to the organs and what was the type of testing? They also wanted to know about the research study. What is the study goal? How long has the study been going on? Um, how many organs have received the intervention and, the, and have been transplanted to date? And what are the results of the intervention research study so far? They also wanted to know about the recipient, specifically what's the nature of the recipient's involvement in the study post-transplant, as well as what are the risks and benefits of participating to recipients. Now, turning to the third of those ethical questions, what is the best way to carry out informed consent? We found that most candidates wanted their autonomy to be respected by engaging in both re research and clinical consent, even though the longer time for conducting both could potentially harm the organ. So we found 75% wanted both research and clinical informed consent, as opposed to 25% who wanted only clinical informed consent. Ultimately, concerns about informed consent become moot if patients would not accept intervention organs. So we wanted to see whether candidates would accept such organs. And this is what our survey really focused on. And our surveys presented 12 hypothetical scenarios that varied by donor age, by projected waiting time to receive another organ offer, by the level of research risk to the organ, and by the level of recipient risk. And we found that most, 96%, would have accepted an intervention organ in at least some conditions. I'd like to conclude with a couple remarks here. Our findings suggest that most candidates prefer conceptualizing intervention organs as human subjects research, even when only accepting intervention organs for transplantation. Most candidates also prefer requiring both research and clinical informed consent, even though a longer consent discussion would potentially harm organ quality. And this means that we need to accommodate patients' preferences for research-informed consent into the consent process to foster patient-centered care. Furthermore, patient participation in clinical trials is important for improving organ quality and function. And organ procurement organizations and transplant professionals should develop approaches to efficiently obtain research-informed consent. I'd like to acknowledge my research team, and I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation, doctor. And we have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. We appreciate the research that helps expand patient choices for transplants. And our first question to you is, AAKP has been very pleased to partner with you in your research efforts over the past several years. Can you tell us how the, how the stories you have heard from patients have impacted you as a professional and your personal understanding of what patients manage day to day? Absolutely. Yes. Um, the experiences that I've heard, the stories from patients have had a big impact on me professionally, as well as on a personal level. I'll tell you, um, hearing patients' voices is so important um, because I learned so much. And by hearing patients' voices, I've learned so much about how their lives are affected by kidney disease. And what, what's so important for me is to be able to, to draw from that information and help to make, um, I wanna make accurate recommendations to improve transplant clinical care, uh, improve transplant education, as well as making policy changes to provide more patient-centered care. 
on a personal level, um, patients' stories have also taught me what's really important about life. You know, there, there are a lot of values that um, the stories have brought to life and for me and, and so much is um, just making the most of what we have. And um, there are issues of our, our values, like our morals and what's fair. And um, all of the stories are, are very important to hear, um, to reinforce those values. Based on your research and your interactions with professionals, are you optimistic that more opportunities for transplants will become available for kidney patients, especially minority patients? I am optimistic about that. Um, there are so many efforts that people are making and increasingly so, um, especially in um, recent months, I would say. So, um, for example, I, I, I'd like to draw on some of my own research to give you an example. Um, in some funding from the NIH, and the NIH funds specifically research on addressing disparities um, in access to transplantation and living donor transplantation in particular. So in my research, I have a, a study where I'm implementing culturally competent care into two other transplant programs that is directed to increase living donor transplantation for the Hispanic Latinx population. And some of the feedback that we received, we're still in the midst of doing the study and, and running our analyses. But in the meantime, I've asked some of the transplant clinicians what they think about what impact are we having. And in one of the one of the transplant clinicians, and I'm gonna quote here, she was saying to me, you know, it, it's not just the trans, not just getting the transplant, but she sees so many steps along the way that this program has been able to help. So here I'm going to quote. She said, um, but what we don't see is all those patients that we helped get through the process. And she's referring to the evaluation process. So we still helped hundreds of patients get their questions answered, maybe even get listed, not just transplanted. And I know that the goal is transplants and live donation. At the same time, especially in the Hispanic community, they don't get their pre-cancer screenings done. So look at all those hundreds and thousands of people that we helped get pre-cancer screenings, that now they know that they don't have cancer, or maybe we did find a cancer, a mammogram, and show a mass that they wouldn't have otherwise known." End quote. Um, Another thing I wanted to share from that same study is that um, one clinician was saying how um, she was commenting on also how the program has affected their center overall. And, and she was reflecting on how they perceived the program at the beginning. And so she said, quote, um, and I really think that we were, we kind of laugh and look back on it, but just like we learned at the beginning meetings um, is that we had this like we we have this in English and Spanish so we're good um, and we're really not we were very naive I think about that we weren't really meeting the needs of the Spanish speaking population just having a document translated into Spanish wasn't enough and I think we've all learned so much through this about the cultural aspects and things that we just didn't realize were barriers for these patients, and that it is in the best interest of those patients in our community to get them transplanted. And so I think there's a lot of motivation still to continue this work in whatever form that looks like, but that we've learned that. And we thought we were doing the right thing, but we weren't doing enough. And I think that's what we see. And that's what we would tell other centers is that just doing those things that we thought were enough isn't enough. What I really love about that is that she was so reflective. And what I want to do is take our program and disseminate it to other transplant centers so they too can help reduce disparities. Besides my research, I know a lot of my other colleagues are doing other kinds of research that also help to reduce disparities. And at a more national level, 
um, I'm happy to say that the American Society of Transplantation just recently formed the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access to Life, also known as the IDEAL Task Force, and it's aiming to increase access to transplantation for minorities, and I'm honored to be a member of this task force. So I do see a lot of movement moving in that direction to reduce disparities in terms of access to transplantation. This concludes the final presentation for this session. Panelists, I want to thank you for your insightful remarks that you have provided to our audience and particularly the patient community today.